Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. You're listening to episode 27 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mystery of near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. In terms of a bottom line, I think NDEs, now some apologists love them and will, uh, and not just Catholic, but non-Catholic as well. Some apologists love them. Some apologists hate them. <laughs> um, they, um, so I've encountered both, you know, people being very favorable or very skeptical towards them. To me, they are intriguing but they are not yet conclusive. Mm -hmm. if, preter, if evidence of preternatural knowledge holds up, then that will provide good evidence of afterlife, and that will shake up things in the world. If we get really solid evidence of people coming back with preternatural knowledge, mm -hmm. that will shake up society. Um, it would not, though, no matter what people come back with, it wouldn't undermine with these brief experiences anything about Christianity because we aren't seeing, even if this is the afterlife, we're not seeing far enough into it. Right. These people are there for a few minutes and come back, according to these experiences. It's not like they get to stay in heaven and have a tour of the a big tour of, of the mysteries of the universe. So the we're not seeing enough to contradict or confirm the uh, fundamental teachings of Christianity. So it doesn't really bear on that one way or another. And finally, as I indicated, uh, these are not the evidence Christianity is based on. It's based on other evidence that we do have in this world right now. And that's what serves as the anchor of our faith. Not these things, although it would be nice if they can provide a little extra chiming in. You're listening to episode 292 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Distressing Near-Death Experiences. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1975, psychiatrist Raymond Moody published the blockbuster book Life After Life. It became an international bestseller. It was translated into a dozen languages, and it sold more than 13 million copies. The book focused on what Moody named Near-Death Experiences, or NDEs. These are experiences people report having in conjunction with life-threatening situations. In many cases, they happened after a person's heart stopped beating. The majority of the NDEs Moody reported were positive. People spoke of reuniting with loved ones, meeting religious figures, seeing a beautiful realm, and experiencing love and bliss. This led some people to ask, what about hell? Could these experiences be real if everyone goes to heaven? But even in Life After Life, Moody reported that not all near-death experiences were positive. Some were distinctly negative. And in subsequent years, researchers have found that as many as one in five NDEs, maybe more, are negative. What happens in these negative experiences? What do they mean? And what are the implications if you have one? That's what we'll be talking about in this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, is there anything we should say as we begin today's episode? Well, today's episode involves some sensitive subject matter. Nothing we cover today will be graphic and nothing we say will be sensationalistic. Uh, we're not going to be proceeding on a doom and gloom, fire and brimstone basis. We will actually show that not all distressing NDEs seem to involve hell. Many of them have a much more positive interpretation than you m might think about. Uh, and we will be covering the subject with the hope of helping people find love and peace in spite of these experiences. But because we're going to be talking about accounts of near-death experiences that are distressing, some of which may involve hell or at least purgatory, uh, this episode may not be suitable for particularly sensitive listeners. In particular, parents should make good listening decisions if they have sensitive children. Uh, we'll also be discussing what people should do if, in the future, they 
find themselves in the middle of a distressing NDE. So even if some of the material is a little uncomfortable, you know, forewarned is forearmed and we'll be having some news you can use. However, there is one group of people that I would not recommend this episode for, and that is people who suffer from extreme scrupulosity or extreme excessive compulsive disorder. Um, People with those conditions should wait to listen to this episode until they have gotten over those conditions and been at least substantially free of them for quite some time, because nobody should be obsessing about having a distressing NDE or scrupulously fearing they might have one. Uh, God loves everybody, and obsessing about this could be counterproductive. Very good. All right, then let's begin. There's a strong impression in the public mind that all near-death experiences are positive. Why are the negative ones so little known? There are a few reasons for this. One is that it's just more fun to hear about positive afterlife experiences than negative ones. Uh, People in the news media talk show hosts and book publishers love to feature reassuring accounts of afterlife bliss. So do people in the NDE community. In fact, as author Nancy Evans Bush frankly admits, the NDE community itself basically ignored or downplayed negative NDEs for many years. In her chapter in the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, Bush writes, Bruce Drayson, editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies for two decades, has been quoted as acknowledging, relative to distressing NDEs, that in the early studies, we didn't try to find them because we didn't want to know. Fortunately, that's now started to change, and NDE researchers are now beginning to do research on negative experiences. Another reason that negative NDEs don't get much attention is that people who have had them often don't like to talk about them. Uh, You know, before Life After Life came out, people were afraid to report any near-death experiences, even positive ones, because people would think that they were crazy. But as knowledge of NDEs has become commonplace, the people who've had them have become more willing to talk about them, except for the people who've had negative ones. Nobody wants to acknowledge that they died and had a frightening or hellish experience, and for understandable reasons. The International Association for Near-Death Studies, also known as IANS, has a page on distressing NDEs and states, Possible reasons that the distressing NDE may be underreported are that distressing NDEers avoid talking about the experience, perhaps because they hope the distressing experience will just go away, They want to avoid re-experiencing the distress that occurs when they talk about the experience. They feel ashamed for having had a distressing experience when so many other people have reported pleasurable experiences and or they are afraid that others will judge them as bad or crazy. So there are multiple reasons that people who've had negative NDEs wouldn't want to talk about them and would want to keep it quiet. Fortunately, some NDE researchers have started seeking out people who may have had negative ones and assured them that they won't think they're crazy, they won't laugh at them, they'll offer a sympathetic, supportive ear, and they won't judge the person. Even then, it's been very hard for them to get that many such people to talk about their experiences. They often find that those who've had this kind of experience will bail out of the discussion as soon as it starts. In the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, Nancy Bush writes, People who have had a terrible NDE are notoriously reluctant to talk. In my own experience, they make contact but do not answer callbacks. They cancel appointments. They disappear. Medical social worker Kimberly Clark, now Sharp, observed in 1986 that there's lots of problems with the negative experience. People will call and begin to talk about them, but then change their mind and say, Goodbye, I have to go. And they often won't tell you who they are when they call. And sometimes I won't hear from them ever again after they related it to me. There also are a number of additional factors that make gathering information on distressing NDEs or DNDEs, as they're sometimes called, hard to get. In the Science Encyclopedia's article on distressing NDEs, Bush writes, A number of related factors make research into distressing NDEs especially difficult. 1. Unreadiness to disclose. Most people need time after an NDE before being ready to talk about it. 
they disclose cautiously and a DNDE compounds that reluctance. Patients in hospital studies are likely to be discharged before they are ready to share their NDE, and cardiac arrest subjects often die before they can be interviewed. 2. What are the questions? Especially with fragile subjects, the interviewer, whose line of questioning is designed to be reassuring and upbeat, is unlikely to elicit disturbing testimony. 3. What does the asker want to know? News of blissful NDEs has had such a positive, reassuring impact, few interviewers have been alert to hints of frightening experiences. Only a handful of those who were alert chose to follow. 4. Who is asking and how? The most accurate information comes when people are interviewed by someone they know and trust, well after the experience, in an informal setting with no time constraints. Inpatient hospital studies, most especially involving cardiac arrest, do not meet any of these conditions, so it is unsurprising that they have not identified distressing NDEs. As a result of factors like these, the data on negative NDEs is very limited at this point, but it is being gathered, and that's a good thing, because the better we understand these experiences, the better we can help the people who've had them, especially if they keep the experience to themselves. Those who have had negative NDEs you know, can feel very alone and afraid and uncertain of what to do. And we need to help and support them all we can. In fact, I fully expect that some people who will listen to this episode, either now or in the future, will have had distressing NDEs. In fact, as I was writing the script for this episode, I received an email from someone who had somehow learned about the episode, and this person shared the fact that they had experienced a distressing NDE. I won't say any more for reasons of privacy, which is an ethical requirement in dealing with such matters, but I hope that this episode helps all such people who to process the experience, to understand it, to figure out what it means or doesn't mean, and what they need to do, and ultimately find peace. You said that some in the NDE community have ignored or downplayed negative experiences, Ignoring negative experiences is fairly straightforward, but what do you mean by downplaying? One of the things that has been done is a kind of misdirection. It involves pointing to pop culture depictions of hell and saying, well, we haven't had anything like that reported. Uh, this actually started with Raymond Moody in Life After Life. For example, he wrote, No one has described the cartoonist heaven of pearly gates, golden streets, and winged harp-playing angels, nor a hell of flames and demons with pitchforks. In context, especially at the time, I don't take this as misdirection. I think that Moody was just saying that he wasn't getting reports of things like you'd see in cartoons of heaven and hell. But afterwards, people would make statements like this while simultaneously ignoring the distressing NDEs that were starting to be reported. And that's misdirection, because that's a cartoon image of hell that's drawn from pop culture. It's not what the church teaches or what well-educated Christians believe hell is going to be like. In the first place, demons are created intelligences that don't have bodies, so they aren't literally red and they don't literally have horns and tails. Those are just images from the imagination of Christian artists, and they aren't even images found in the Bible. But more fundamentally, the church does not teach that demons will torment people in hell, either with pitchforks or anything else. That's also an idea drawn from culture, and that's not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible indicates that demons will also be suffering in hell, not that they will cause people to suffer. And th this is just misdirection if you say we've never had anyone report this pop culture image of hell, and you ignore the negative experiences that people have reported. You said that negative NDEs were reported in Raymond Moody's initial book, Life After Life. What did he say there? When answering a question about whether he uncovered any cases of NDEs after a person committed suicide, he wrote, I do know of a few cases in which a suicide attempt was the cause of the apparent death. These experiences were uniformly characterized as being unpleasant. As one woman said, If you leave here a tormented soul, 
you will be a tormented soul over there, too. In short, they report that the conflicts they had attempted suicide to escape were still present when they died, but with added complications. In their disembodied state, they were unable to do anything about their problems, and they also had to view the unfortunate consequences which resulted from their acts. A man who was despondent about the death of his wife shot himself, died as a result, and was resuscitated. He states, I didn't go where my wife was. I went to an awful place. I immediately saw the mistake I had made. I thought, I wish I hadn't done it. Others who experienced this unpleasant limbo state have remarked that they had the feeling that they would be there for a long time. This was their penalty for breaking the rules by trying to release themselves prematurely from what was in effect an assignment to fulfill a certain purpose in life. Such remarks coincide with what has been reported to me by several people who died of other causes, but who said that, while they were in this state, it had been intimated to them that suicide was a very unfortunate act which attended with a severe penalty. One man who had a near-death experience after an accident said, While I was over there, I got the feeling that the two other things it was completely forbidden for me to do would be to kill myself or to kill another person. If I were to commit suicide, I would be throwing God's gift back in his face. Killing somebody else would be interfering with God's purpose for that individual. Sentiments like these, which by now have been expressed to me in many separate accounts, are identical to those embodied in the most ancient theological and moral argument against suicide, one which occurs in various forms in the writings of thinkers as diverse as St. Thomas Aquinas, Locke, and Kant. A suicide, in Kant's view, is acting in opposition to the purposes of God and arrives on the other side viewed as a rebel against his creator. Aquinas argues that life is a gift from God and that it is God's prerogative, not man's, to take it back. In discussing this, however, I do not pass a moral judgment against suicide. I only report what others who have been through this experience have told me. So right there in the very first book on near-death experiences, we have reports of negative ones, particularly in the cases of people who have committed suicide. Some listeners will know people who have committed suicide. So let's pause for a moment and ask a question from the faith perspective. If a person commits suicide... Does that mean that the person automatically goes to hell? From a Catholic perspective, the answer is no. Suicide is objectively wrong, but just because you do something wrong doesn't mean that you're fully responsible for it. Many people who commit suicide are under extreme psychological pressures. This means that they may not be fully responsible for their actions, and to the extent that's true, God knows it. He knows if someone isn't fully responsible for what they're doing, and he'll only hold them accountable for the degree of responsibility that they actually have. Furthermore, the Christian faith teaches that a person may repent and turn to God right up to the very end, even in the last split second of life. As a result, people who start to kill themselves may turn back to God before the act is completed. I once heard a story of a woman's husband who had jumped off a bridge to commit suicide, and a saint assured her that he had a revelation that the husband repented between the time he jumped and the time he died. I've also heard a saying that pertains to this. It's based on the situation of a person who is about to die by hanging, you know, like maybe they've strung the person up by the neck and seated him on a horse and then they kick him off, the, get the horse to move out from under him. So he hangs. And the saying is, between the bootstrap and the ground, pardon sought is pardon found. So even if someone repents at the very last instant, they can still be saved. Committing suicide thus does not mean that a person is lost, and that is official church teaching. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. We should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways known to him alone, God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. The church prays for persons who have taken their own lives. I would also add that, as we heard in episode 208 on time travel prayer, we can even pray backwards in time for a person at the moment of their death. So we can ask God to help a person who was committing suicide 
to accept his offer of grace and love and come to be with him in heaven. Excellent. So how common are distressing NDEs? Well, that's one of the key questions. It's one of the things that everybody researching this would really like to know. However, because of the difficulties we've just been describing, including researchers not wanting to know about negative NDEs, uh, negative NDE experiencers not wanting to talk about them, and the primitive state of the research and the imprecision that accompanies early stages of research, we really don't know. We don't have a solid answer to this question. On the low side, several studies have been done that found no negative experiences, zero but they may not have been looking for them, and they're clearly wrong because negative NDEs have been reported. Then I've seen a reference to one study that reported only 1% of NDEs were negative, and that's clearly too low because of what other studies have found. In the Science Encyclopedia, Nancy Bush reports, Despite the absence of distressing NDEs in those studies, 11 others with 1,359 NDEs reported, 315, 23%, as disturbing, terrifying, despairing, or hellish. Across 21 studies between 1975 and 2005, 17.2% of the NDEs were distressing. So a collection of studies put together f reported that 23% of NDEs were distressing. That's almost 25% or one in four. And a collection of studies spanning 30 years found that 17.2% or basically one in six were distressing. These experiences are thus far from being rare. And even these ex number even, even these numbers may be too low because of the underreporting of negative NDEs that we know happens. But something like between one in six and one in four is a reasonable minimum estimate. We could call it one in five. Do all people who experience negative NDEs report the same kinds of things happening to them, or are there different kinds of distressing NDEs? There are different kinds of them, uh, and so far researchers have divided them up into three or four classes. These are sometimes referred to by numbers as type 1, type 2, type 3, and sometimes type 4 experiences. Then let's go through them individually and see how they compare to each other. What are type 1 negative NDEs, and what would be an example of one? Type 1 negative NDEs are basically the same as regular positive NDEs, but they are perceived differently by the person who has one. They include the same basic elements like floating out of your body, seeing it from above, seeing doctors and nurses working on your body, then a sense of motion through a tunnel, encountering light, meeting spiritual beings, including religious ones, glimpsing another realm, and so on. Except, instead of perceiving these things with joy and bliss, they come across to the experiencer as disturbing or frightening. Here's an example from Nancy Bush's book, Dancing Past the Dark. It's a report that comes from a woman named Barbara. Both my eyes were completely swollen shut and I was having difficulty breathing. After a few minutes, my body began to shake violently. I then experienced the sensation of floating above the room. I saw a clear picture of myself lying on the table. I saw the doctor and the nurse, whom I had never seen before, and my husband standing by my body. I became frightened, and I remember strongly feeling I didn't like what I saw and what was happening. I shouted, I don't like this, but I was not heard by those in the room. After a while, one eye opened a little, and I saw that the room and the people were exactly as I had seen them during my floating sensation. This is a very brief NDE. Barbara didn't go through that many of the elements of a typical experience. Uh, she did leave her body and see it from above and people working on it, but she wasn't tranquil and relaxed about this. She found it distressing, became frightened, and started shouting that she didn't like the experience. Then she was back in her body and found the same people, some of whom she'd never seen before, in the room with her. Others may go deeper into the NDE and see more of the typical elements they contain, but they continue to perceive the elements they encounter as disturbing and alarming. Uh, 
that's the essence of a type 1 experience. The same elements as normal, but perceived negatively rather than blissfully. As a result, type 1 negative NDEs are sometimes called inverted NDEs because the person's emotional state is inverted from positive to negative. Then what about type 2 negative NDEs? How are they different and what happens in them? Type 2 negative NDEs are sometimes referred to as void experiences for reasons that will become clear. They may begin like a typical NDE with a person leaving their body, seeing it from above, moving through a tunnel and so forth. But then they go in a different direction. In Dancing Past the Dark, Bush explains, These accounts include out-of-body episodes, a sense of movement and great speed, intense affect, darkness, strong messages, and a sense of ultimate truth. Although loved ones and welcoming beings are rarely in evidence, there may be encounters with other presences. Rarely is there a life review. The light is not perceived. But that, of course, defines this type of experience, which may leave a pervasive residue of emptiness and fatalistic despair after the event. Several of the people whose experiences are included here were still in psychotherapy, and some of them 20 years after their NDE. Nancy Bush herself actually had a type 2 distressing NDE, which was what started her interest in near-death experiences, including distressing ones. So we'll quote her experience at some length. It occurred when she was 28 years old and had gone into the hospital for the birth of her second child. As they were preparing to deliver the child, she was given anesthesia, and then this happened. What I knew next was that I found myself awake and somehow flying over a building. A quick glimpse backward, oddly with no sense of turning around, and I could see box-like structures on the roof of what I thought must be the hospital, because there up the hill was the window of the classroom where I taught. There was the town receding swiftly below me, and then the dark outline of hills along the river and the Earth's curvature. It's true, it really is round. And finally, the planet becomes smaller and smaller, while I continued into... Where? Years later, I would describe it as hurtling into space like an astronaut without a capsule, for the first astronaut had gone into space only a year earlier. The speed was puzzling. It felt like drifting, but I was covering enormous distances at what felt like an angle headed northeast. Is there a northeast in space? The nighttime darkness turned into immensity and a different sort of dark. It was thinner somehow, shading inexplicably toward what might have been a paler horizon except that there was no horizon. My impression was that God was over there. I was utterly alone. There was nothing but that strange dark twilight and the awareness of being there and emptiness. There was a sense of form to me, I recall, or at least of presence, but no body. It was as if I were made of veiling, just insubstantial. But I was thinking, did I have a mind or was I being a mind? An unanswerable question. A group of circles appeared ahead and slightly to my left, perhaps a half dozen of them moving toward me. Half black and half white, they clicked as they flew, snapping white to black, black to white, sending an authoritative message without words. Somehow, its meaning was clear. This is all there is. This is all there ever was. This is it. Anything else you remember is a joke. You are not real. You never were real. You never existed. Your life never existed. The world never existed. It was a game you were allowed to invent. There was never anything or anyone. That's the joke. That it was all a joke. The circles felt heckling but not evil. Mocking, mechanistic, clicking without feeling. They seemed like messengers, certain of what they were saying, not ultimate authority themselves, but with an authoritative message. I argued passionately to prove them wrong, throwing out details of my mother's girlhood, stories of my husband's youth, facts from history, things I could not have experienced myself. Other people must exist, for how would I know these things if someone had not told me? And my first baby, the toddler Katie waiting at home? I knew that baby, the feel of the sturdy little body, the smell of her rosy babiness. I couldn't have made her up. And childbirth, why would any woman, even an imaginary woman, invent childbirth? And what about this unborn baby? Whatever you remember is part of the joke. Your mother, your babies, they were never real, they mocked. This is all there is, all there ever was, just this. 
but God? The thin darkness stretched off into nothingness, a thin, not quite mist of dusk, and the circles kept clicking, and then I was entirely alone. The circles had moved out of sight, and there was nothing left. The world unreal and gone, and with it my first baby, and this baby who would never be born, and all other babies. Everyone I knew and loved, but how had I known them if they were never real? They were gone. And hills and robins? There was no world, no home, no babies, not even a self to go home to. I thought that no one could bear so much grief, but there seemed no end of it, and no way out. Everyone, everything gone, even God, and I was alone forever in the swimming twilight dark. And then I was groggily coming, too, in a hospital bed. It took Nancy Bush a long time to deal with her distressing NDE, and you can see why this kind is referred to as a void experience, because she felt alone in a dark void of nothingness. It started like a regular NDE, with her leaving her body and seeing things from above. Then she perceived herself floating in an extremely fast manner, in her case through what seemed like space, outer space. But then it started to go differently when she encountered a group of six circles coming towards her. In later years, she encountered the Chinese yin-yang symbol, and she immediately thought that this looked like the group of what she described as circles moving towards her. Snapping back and forth between black and white and sending her the message that she and all the things she'd experienced were just an unreal joke. The yin-yang circles seem to be unique to Bush's experience, and other people have, have simpler void experiences. For example, here's one from a woman called Jeannie who had a void experience while she was being attacked by a man who was trying to strangle her. Eleven years ago, I had a near-death experience. I found myself floating in a void, and nobody was there, not even God. I was overwhelmed with loneliness and despair because I knew this was eternity. I don't know how long this lasted or if I stopped breathing. I was being strangled at the time. If you need to know these things, the man who attacked me might remember. Just don't tell him where I am. I hope this will help your research. So Jeannie had a much simpler experience. As the man was strangling her, she found herself floating in a void. She didn't perceive God as being there, and she was overwhelmed with loneliness and despair, thinking that she would be there for all eternity. What about type 3 distressing NDEs? What happens in those? These are referred to as hellish experiences, and they incorporate something that the experiencer perceives as hell. According to the IN's website, these experiences included hellish imagery such as an ugly or foreboding landscape, demonic beings, loud annoying noises, frightening animals, and other beings in extreme distress. In Dancing Past the Dark, Nancy Bush explains that some of the first information about hellish NDEs came in brief descriptions, often in short letters from family members, though sometimes from the experiencers themselves. Here are some of these very brief descriptions. When my mother-in-law came to consciousness, she had the most terrified look I'd ever seen. And she said to me, I've just seen Dante's Inferno. That was all. She wouldn't say any more. After he was able to speak, my brother-in-law told of this experience. He felt himself slipping down some stairs and down and down in blackness and scared and a deep fear. He got to bottom and saw some very large rusty doors with a rusty lock and chain and people sitting outside on benches. He was so afraid of what he saw he was in a panic and knew he was at the very doors of hell and with great effort climbed back up those stairs to the outside world again and realized they were working on him to get a heartbeat. Hell is a pit, and there is darkness, but there is also fire. I was in a place to which the Bible refers as outer darkness, and it is not pretty. After my experience, I could not talk about it. I did not want people to know that I had gone to hell. Some people may just want to laugh this hell business off, but as real as this letter is, so is that place. With time, some fuller accounts emerged, such as this one from a woman called Fran. The doctor leaned over close to me and told me I was dying. The muscles in my body began to jerk upward out of control. I could no longer speak, but I knew what was happening. Although my body slowed down, things around me and things happening to me went rather fast. I then felt my body slipping down, not straight down, but on an angle, as if on a slide. It was cold, dark, and watery. 
When I reached the bottom, it resembled the entrance to a cave with what looked like webs hanging. The inside of the cave was gray and brown in color. I heard cries, wails, moans, and the gnashing of teeth. I saw these beings that resembled humans with the shape of a head and body, but they were ugly and grotesque. I remember colors like red, green, and purple, but can't positively remember if this was the color of these beings. They were frightening and sounded like they were tormented in agony. No one spoke to me. I never went inside the cave, but stood at the entrance only. I remember saying to myself, I don't want to stay here. I tried to lift myself up as though trying to pull myself, my spirit, up out of this pit. That's the last I remember. The type three hellish experiences come in the greatest variety of forms, but what they all have in common is that they involve things that the experiencer perceives as hell. Ooh, where do we go after that? You said that there is a type four experience. What could that possibly involve? Well, this category isn't used by all negative NDE researchers, but it is listed on the IN's website as a type 4 category. It was identified by Dr. Barbara Romer in her research, and it focuses on an element that is found in other near-death experiences, which has come to be called the life review. And the IN's website explains the essence of this experience as follows. The nde -er feels negatively judged by a higher power during their NDE life review, in which typically the experiencer reviews and re-experiences every moment of their life. This latter type of distressing NDE contrasts sharply with the life review that sometimes occurs in a pleasurable NDE. In the predominantly pleasurable experience, the nde -er feels absolutely loved even as they review and re-experience the most unloving actions they committed during their lives. During this process, the nde -er typically is simultaneously themselves and each person with whom they interacted. Thus, in the pleasurable NDE, the nde -er experiences what it was to have been on the receiving end of their actions, and typically experiences profound regret and or guilt, but within a larger context of being unconditionally loved. In the distressing NDE, by contrast, the nde -er only feels negatively judged. So type 4 experiences, sometimes called negative judgment experiences, focus on a particular element commonly reported in other NDEs. Many experiencers report having a life review done in which they see the events of their lives, including the bad things they've done, and they genuinely regret these experiences and feel the pain that they've called other, caused others, but within a context of love and understanding that they perceive as being an overall positive. However, in these cases, the experiencer doesn't perceive the love and understanding, and for them, the negative judgment experiencers, the whole experience comes across as negative. You might consider this as simply a variation on type 1 or inverted experiences, where the person experiences an emotional inversion of the typical life review. But Barbara Romer and the International Association for Near-Death Studies, or at least their website, classify it as a separate type 4 experience. To give you an example of what this experience is like, here's a report from Barbara Romer's book, Blessing in Disguise. It's a report of a woman called Anita who was an atheist and who had apparently died as the result of a drug overdose. The first thing I remember is feeling like I was being restrained, like I couldn't move, and there was no reason I couldn't move. I'm one of those people who can't stand to be tied up. Finally, I did get loose, and I know this will sound strange, but there were people walking around in what I thought were white uniforms. I thought I was on the deck of a cruise ship. I was trying to find my way out. Finally, I was able to break free, like from the upper part of my body. The room I was in first was small and white. There wasn't anything there but a bed and a chair. I looked at myself. I was in the bed and I looked like hell. I broke free, first from the upper part of my body and then I was walking through the corridors. That's when I saw my grandfather. My grandfather had died about a year before. I told him I wanted to leave and he wouldn't let me. He was in a grumpy mood, which was always how he was. He was very stubborn. He said, what the hell are you thinking? You're not going anywhere. Go back to your room. I thought this was very strange. He was wearing like a white robe, which was not his usual dress, and he was wearing a gray blue shirt underneath and nothing on his feet. 
He was standing in front of a door to a room that I wanted to get into, but he wouldn't let me. Where I was, it was cold and dark. The room I couldn't get into, I knew was warm and had sunlight and sky. I knew the beach was there. There was a man standing with my grandfather. He looked like Jesus Christ with long hair and a beard and a mustache. He had on simple clothing and sandals on his feet. I didn't really confront him at all, but I knew he was mad, though, because he was carrying the same expression as my grandfather, which was very disapproving. They were not going to let me pass them. It was then that I saw everything that I ever did wrong. I was on trial. It was strange. I saw things that happened years and years ago that I couldn't even remember in my own consciousness. It was like they were judging. It was like a big, broad sweep where I saw all the bad things I ever did. Honestly, it felt like I was in hell already. I felt like I was being judged for absolutely every single thing I had ever done. After I saw all of that, my grandfather said I had to go back, and I knew I did if he said so. I remembered what his wrath could be like from when I was younger. I always trusted him, though. He was a good man, even if he was grumpy. So I went back to my room. I felt alone in that room. I kept waiting, and it seemed like I waited forever. Then finally, I felt restricted again, and there I was back in my body. Now I know I'm here for a purpose. I still don't know what it is, but this gave me a kick in the butt to tell me I'd better find out what I'm supposed to be doing on this fine planet. I guess, if I'm going to be honest now, I'd better tell you that I was trying to take the easy way out. I'm a fighter, and I don't give up easily, but I was trying to give up. So Anita says that, speaking honestly, she was trying to take the easy way out with her drug overdose. This was thus another case of attempted suicide, like those Raymond Moody could reported could lead to negative NDEs. During the experience, Anita's grandfather and a man who looked like Jesus Christ and who may have been Jesus Christ showed her the bad things she had done, and then she was told to go back to her room in the afterlife and wait. Fortunately, back on Earth, her boyfriend found her. Uh, She was without a heartbeat or respiration, but he got emergency help for her. She spent nearly two weeks in intensive care in the hospital on a ventilator, and she concluded that this was a positive experience, that it gave her the kick in the butt she needed to reform her life. And Barbara Romer reports, After she recuperated, she made a total about-face, made amends to people she knew she had wronged, and even moved away from Florida, which she termed the drug capital of the world. So even though this was a negative experience at the time for Anita, it ended up playing a positive role in her life. Are there any other kinds of experiences we should discuss besides the four types we've covered? There is one, and it's essentially a combination or hybrid experience. In other words, it has both positive and negative elements. Here's an example that Nancy Bush reports from a woman named Rachel. I'm not here to convince anyone of the following, as I myself am not totally convinced. I know that it all happened, and yet, logically, I cannot account for the happening. Or possibly... I just can't totally accept the reality of it because I am Jewish and I do not believe in Jesus Christ. I only believe in God. It was February 1975. The roads were disastrous, covered with ice and snow. My husband and I were traveling to my mother-in-law's to drop off the two boys when an oncoming vehicle slid over three lanes to hit us head on. The roof of our car collapsed and my head was stuck between windshield, dash, and roof. Supposedly, I was unconscious to all onlookers, yet something weird was happening to me. Maybe I was dreaming, but it was so real. I really don't know. Maybe you will know and will be able to explain to me what actually occurred. I've asked God many times since then why he just did not let me die as I so desired upon the touch of that hand. I was in a circle of light. I looked down upon the accident. I looked directly into the car that struck ours and I saw a young woman with her head bent down resting on the steering wheel and I knew that she was dead. I looked into my car and saw myself trapped and unconscious. I saw several cars stop and a lady taking my children to her car to sit and rest until the ambulance would arrive. I heard all the commotion and all the goings on and I saw it all. I heard my husband talk to me and I saw me never moving and never answering. From the time that I left until the time that I returned was only a matter of minutes in reality. And yet my experience was so slow and quiet and peaceful from that time on when I was in the circle of light. A hand touched mine, and I turned to see where this peace and serenity and blissful feeling was coming from. And there was Jesus Christ. 
I mean, the way he is made out to be in all the paintings with white robe and beard and hood draped and so soft and sweet and so angelic. And I never wanted to leave this man in this place. I never looked or thought back upon the accident scene or earth again until the final experience prodded me to do so. I was led around a well because I wanted to stay with him and hold his hand. He led me from a side of bliss to a side of misery. I did not want to look, but he made me look and I was disgusted and horrified and scared. It was so ugly. The people were blackened and sweaty and moaning in pain and chained to their spots. I had to walk through the area back to the well. One person was even chained to the evil side of the well. I hated it there. I couldn't wait to get to the well and go around it. He led me to it, but he made me go through it alone as he watched. Someone else followed me through and then stepped in front of me to help me walk over the debris on the ground. Snakes or something. I never looked at this thing, but I know it was dark. The man was so skeletal and in such pain, the one chained by the side of the well, I wanted them to help him, but no one would. And I knew that I would be one of these creatures if I stayed because of what I saw in the well. I knew that if I elected to stay because of the greatest, most serene feeling, that I would only have misery because he didn't want me to stay. I leaned over the well and this young Jesus lookalike, maybe it was God himself or maybe the Christians aren't as peculiar as I think they are, put his hand on my back as I looked in. There were three children calling, Mommy, 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 we need you. Please come back to us. There were two boys and a girl. The two boys were much older than my two little ones and I didn't have a little girl. The little girl looked up at me. They were inside the well in water and begged me to go back to life. And then all at once, I was in the circle again, his hand still on my shoulder, and I saw the accident scene again, and I cried that I did not ever want to leave him. And then I heard my babies cry and saw the lady taking them to her car, and I knew I had to leave and get back. It was my responsibility. I moaned, awake in the car again, and I screamed for my children. I knew where they were, but I demanded that my husband tell me about the lady taking them to her car. I wanted to make sure that what I saw was real. And then the police and ambulance men tried to get me out of the wreck. Nobody wanted to tell me that the girl in the other car died, but I knew she had because I saw her, even if no one there knew that I did. Well, several years later, I had a baby. I knew it would be the little girl in the well. It's strange, but at the time of the accident and following, I knew that I no longer loved my husband, but I stayed with him. Right after the birth of my little girl, we got divorced. Many times these past years, I thought about giving up my children to their father because of the things he could do for them financially. But I always dismiss it because of my experience and how they cried and needed me in the well. I'm supposed to raise them, I know that. I also know that there is truly a higher being and something after this life. In this experience, it appears that Rachel did not physically die, but only went unconscious. However, this would still count as a near-death experience because it occurred during a life-threatening situation. And your heart doesn't have to stop for you to have an NDE. Various NDEs are only near-death, which is part of why they're called near-death experiences rather than cardiac arrest experiences. In this case, Rachel experienced both positive and negative things. On the positive side, she met a man who looked like Jesus and who may have been Jesus, who was radiating peace, serenity, and bliss at her. And she very much wanted to stay with him. But he showed her a well, on one side of which were what appeared to be damned souls. And she understood that if she stayed, she would become like them. Then the Jesus figure showed her why this would happen. He showed her her own future children, including a little girl she hadn't had yet. So this was an announcing experience where she learned about a future child that she would have, like we discussed recently in episode 282 on announcing dreams. And her children were calling to her from inside a well that they needed her and begged her to come back to life on earth. So if she stayed in the afterlife, she would be bailing on her responsibility to her children, including one that wasn't even born yet. And she determined to go back and take care of them. Rachel's experience thus had both positive and negative elements in it. Not all such hybrid experiences have the same elements, but they all have ones that are both positive and negative, which is what qualifies them as hybrids. What kinds of people have negative NDEs. Do we have any data on that? In her article in the Science Encyclopedia, Nancy Bush writes, What kind of person has a distressing NDE? For now, says scholars, the best answer is probably that NDEs appear 
for the most part, to be equal opportunity transpersonal experiences. People with NDEs cover the same range of demographic characteristics as people without NDEs. No distinguishing data mark those who have a DNDE. Saints have endured horrendous near-death and other spiritual experiences. Despite that, a conviction persists that a distressing NDE is evidence of a person's being mean, guilty, hostile, angry, unloving, rigid, egocentric, God-denying, or spiritually lacking. This view rests on supposition alone, as no supporting data exist. There is no evidence that NDEs function as a clear-cut reward or punishment, or that character is a determinant. I think that there are elements of truth in this assessment. I'm not surprised at all that negative NDEs cut across demographic categories. And I think it's true that we don't really have the data needed to identify specific characteristics of people who've had negative ones. Uh, that's partly because who is mean, guilty, hostile, angry, unloving, rigid, egocentric, and so forth is something that can't be objectively assessed. We never know the hearts of other people, so we can never know the internal states of their souls. Also, even when a person is doing objectively bad things, they may not be responsible for what they're doing, either because they lack the needed knowledge of its moral character or because they lack the kind of deliberation needed to be responsible for it. They may, for example, have educational backgrounds or psychological conditions that deprive them of full responsibility. Furthermore, even if someone was a bad person during most of their life, they may have repented, perhaps even just as they were dying, which is another reason we can't know the state of a person's heart. I also think that we don't have this data because people aren't looking for it. You know, when an NDE researcher is interviewing someone who's had a negative NDE and they want to be supportive to the person to encourage them to talk, they don't ask questions like, so are you a mean, guilty, hostile, angry, unloving, rigid, or egocentric person? So I think this data is simply not being collected. And on top of that, we have extremely limited data on negative NDEs to begin with due to the severe underreporting of them and the reluctance of researchers to ask about them. So I think it's quite true that we don't have the data to establish very many things about who has negative NDEs. But I also think that Bush is totally slanting things in her assessment. She makes it sound like it's totally random whether you have a negative NDE, but not having the data needed to make confident predictions is not the same as being totally random. It could well be that people with certain characteristics, like being unloving towards others, are more likely to have a negative experience. We just don't have the objectively ass accessible data needed to show this. Furthermore, Bush is ignoring one of the earliest findings, which was Raymond Moody's observation that negative experiences were associated with suicide. In 1975, that was simply an anecdotal finding, but it's held up on further research. Barbara Romer studied a group of more than 300 individuals. She refers to negative NDEs in her writings as less than positive experiences or LTPs, and she reports, The most common causes of LTPs in my study were self-induced death, 30.6%, and physical illness, 30.6%, which lead to the person's death. So if you look at the cause of death, 30% 30 30 of people who had less than positive NDEs had died by suicide. And since the global suicide rate is only 1.3% of the population, that would suggest that committing suicide is strongly associated with having a negative experience. Basically, 1% of people commit suicide, but 30% of those with negative experiences had done that. There's more to say about what may cause negative NDEs, but we'll cover that when we get to the faith and reason perspectives. We've covered the basic types of distressing NDEs that researchers have identified. Do we have any sense of how common the different types are? 
I did a lot of research trying to find information on this, and it was very frustrating. I looked at Barbara Romer's research. Uh, she did a study of more than 300 people, and she gave statistics about certain aspects of her study. But I couldn't find anywhere that she gave an overall statistical summary of the categories, you know, it, how the four categories she used broke down percentage-wise. Nancy Bush and a very famous NDE researcher named Bruce Grayson, uh, no relation to Batman and Robin, did a study of 50 negative NDE experiencers. And in their study, they identified the first three types, the inverse experience, the void experience, and the hellish experience. They didn't use Barbara Romer's type four negative judgment category. And they didn't break out hybrid experiences as a separate category. I looked in multiple places, but I couldn't find anywhere that they gave percentages or a numerical breakdown of how many people had reported which category. The only thing I was able to find was a statement on the IAN's website that said, of the three categories, type one or inverse experiences are the most common. The type two or void experiences are the next most common. And the type three or hellish experiences are the least common. The page also said that type four or negative judgment experiences are the least common of all. However, without percentages or numbers of cases to look at, I can't have confidence in any of these assessments. These may just be anecdotal impressions or wishes, you know, on the part of whoever wrote the IAN's webpage. Furthermore, even if I had numbers, we couldn't place a great deal of confidence in them. One reason being that we're dealing with a small number of experiencers, just a few hundred people. Another reason is that the people who reported their experiences were self-selected. That is, they volunteered to tell the researchers about what they experienced. And that self-selection may have influenced what got reported. You know, for example, people who had really hellish experiences may have simply not volunteered to tell their story, in which case type three hellish experiences might be more common than what the researchers ended up hearing about. So I'm afraid that we, once again, have very limited data to go on and can't draw firm conclusions. However, this shouldn't stop us from looking at the experiences based on what we do know from the perspectives of faith and reason. All right, and before we get to that, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Joseph J., Rebecca B., Alexander S., Louis M., and Juana L. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. So, Jimmy, what theories do we need to consider about negative near-death experiences? First, there's the naturalistic theory. As we covered in episode 27, our first discussion on negative, on near-death experiences, not everybody believes that they really involve the afterlife. Some people think that they're just due to brain chemistry and synapses firing in weird ways as the brain shuts down. So we need to consider whether disturbing NDEs could be due to factors like this. Second, if some NDEs do involve the afterlife, what do disturbing NDEs say about it? One possibility is that the disturbing experiences aren't real, even though other peaceful NDEs are real. Another possibility is that the disturbing NDEs don't actually point to anything disturbing. Instead, they are misunderstandings of things that are actually pleasant. And if a disturbing NDE had gone on longer, it would have resolved itself into a pleasant experience. Yet another possibility is that disturbing NDEs do 
point to something disturbing, or at least something unpleasant, like hell or purgatory. Third, from the faith perspective, we'll want to ask, what do disturbing NDEs suggest, if anything, about the populations of hell and purgatory? Fourth, we need to consider what a person should do if he finds himself having a disturbing NDE. After all, we're all going to die someday. So if you end up in a disturbing NDE, is there anything you can do about it? And finally, we need to discuss how people who have had disturbing NDEs should react to them. How can they deal with having had such an experience? How can they find peace and live with it? And are there particular things that they need to do? Jimmy, today's mystery incorporates elements of both faith and reason. So rather than keeping the two perspectives strictly separate, we're going to be mixing them a little bit. Still, let's start with an element from reason. What can we say about disturbing NDEs from the reason perspective? What about the idea that all NDEs are just due to things going on in the brain, so people who have disturbing ones just have different things happening in their brains as they're dying? The credibility of this as a global explanation for disturbing NDEs, meaning overall explanation, will depend on the credibility of the naturalistic theory of NDEs in general. However, I find that hypothesis problematic. In the first place, there are lots of speculations about what might be happening in the brain that could explain aspects of NDEs, but speculations are just that, speculations. Nobody has proof that any of the proposed mechanisms are what's actually responsible for NDEs. But more fundamentally, the proposed speculations do not explain all of the aspects of NDEs. In particular, they do not explain it when a person comes back from an NDE with veridical knowledge. That is to say, they come back knowing information they had no natural way of knowing before they died. In a future episode, we'll discuss one case involving a woman who, for privacy reasons, is known only as Maria. She had an NDE in a hospital, and while she was dead, she left her body and floated to other places in and around the hospital. While doing that, she saw a shoe on a ledge outside one of the hospital windows. When she came back, she animatedly told one of the hospital workers about the shoe, and she was so insistent about it that the hospital worker went looking. Well, sure enough, the worker found that there was a shoe on a ledge outside one of the windows, and it was positioned in such a way that it could not have been seen from the, from the ground level, so Maria could not have been able to see it on her way into the hospital. We'll cover that incident in more detail in the future, but it's an example of someone having an NDE and returning with veridical or accurate information that they had no natural way of knowing. And this is evidence that supports the survival of consciousness after death. So I don't think that purely naturalistic explanations are good global explanations for NDEs which means that we can't simply write off disturbing NDEs on the grounds that all NDEs have naturalistic explanations. Okay, so if some NDEs do involve an afterlife, what do disturbing NDEs say about it? Could it be that the disturbing ones aren't real, even though the other peaceful NDEs are real? Uh, the first thing I want to say is that some NDEs may have a natural explanation, and that includes distressing ones. If a person is in a medical emergency, and especially if they've been given drugs like painkillers, their perceptions can be disoriented and inaccurate. For example, they may interpret the medical workers who are trying to save them as horrible, frightening figures who are attacking them and they may perceive the pain of their injuries or of medical procedures being performed as wounds that are being inflicted on them deliberately. In these cases, we would have a, naturalist, a naturalistic explanation for these distressing NDEs. However, situations like this don't apply to all distressing NDEs, and in this episode, we're focusing on ones where explanations like that don't seem to apply, that don't seem to have naturalistic explanations. So if you want to say that regular near-death experiences really involve the afterlife, but that distressing ones don't, 
then you're need to, going to need to do two things. The first is you're going to need to propose a criterion, something that sets the distressing experiences apart from the regular ones. And second, you need to provide evidence that when this criterion applies, it indicates that the negative experiences are purely naturalistic. Can you think of any such criteria, things that would distinguish real NDEs from distressing false ones? Not really. Uh, not any good reasons, at any rate. I can understand why a person might want to say that blissful NDEs are real while distressing NDEs are not. You know, I mean, that would be very comforting if it were true. But we can't distinguish between things just based on what we want to be true. And I can't think of a good criterion that would let us say some are real and some aren't just based on their emotional content. After all, as we've already heard, they often involve exactly the same elements, especially in the inverted distressing experiences where they have the usual elements, except they appear alarming and frightening rather than comforting. If the naturalistic explanation doesn't work for regular NDEs that have these elements, then why should otherwise identical experiences that just have a different emotional feeling be naturally explainable all of a sudden? Then let's consider the possibility that the disturbing NDEs don't actually point to anything disturbing. Instead, they're misunderstandings of things that are actually pleasant, and that if a disturbing NDE had continued longer, it would resolve itself into a pleasant one. What do you make of this proposal? This view has been supported by several researchers, and it's one of the key proposals in Nancy Bush's book, Dancing Past the Dark. She doesn't assert it as a 100% for sure fact, but she states that there is reason to believe that a disturbing NDE is simply an incomplete NDE. And if the experience had gone on for long enough, it would have become pleasant. So the negative emotions that some people experience are a kind of temporary adjustment reaction. And if the person stops fighting the experience, they will get to the point of bliss. What do you make of that suggestion? I think that it likely has some truth to it. In the first place, there are distressing NDEs where the experience starts in an alarming manner but then as the experiencer gets used to what's happening, relaxes, and stops fighting the experience, it becomes pleasant. So that is reported in the literature. Second, I think to an extent that this proposal makes sense uh, to an extent. If we set aside NDEs and look at out-of-body experiences or OBEs instead, well, some people have unexpected OBEs, uh, particularly in crisis situations. And when that happens, they're often startled and shocked to find themselves out of their bodies. It can be an alarming experience. And they may be carrying with them all of the alarming emotions from the crisis that prompted the OBE, which could make the experience of being outside their bodies even more alarming. So now let's imagine someone who's in a traumatic situation and unexpectedly dies. They find themselves outside of their bodies, and this is surprising and shocking. And they're carrying negative emotions from their unexpected traumatic death. So this adds to how their experience of suddenly being outside of their bodies strikes them as distressing and alarming. You know, I know a lot of people would absolutely freak out if they were to unexpectedly find themselves out of their bodies. So I think a distressed, alarmed reaction could be a natural thing. Furthermore, they may keep on resisting the experience, even once they realize what's happening. They may say things like, no, 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 I'm too young to die. I like the way my life was going. My family needs me. I still have things I need to do. And as long as they keep resisting like that, the experience could continue to be distressing. But then, once they get used to what's happening and relax and start stop fighting and get reconciled to the experience, then the experience may come across as pleasant and blissful. So I think it's quite possible that the distressing nature of some NDEs could be an interpretation and reaction decision. It's not a fundamental feature of the experience, but it's how the person is interpreting it and reacting to it. And when they take a new approach, 
and interpret it and react to it differently, the emotions they experience could change. Would this apply equally to all distressing NDEs so that all of them would eventually become pleasant? This is why I said that I thought there is likely some truth to Bush's proposal, because I don't think that it applies equally well to all types of distressing NDEs. The one it fits the best are type one or inverse distressing experiences. These are just like regular ones, except the person's emotional reaction is different. So maybe the distressing emotions they experience are just caused by their shock, surprise, and resistance to the NDE. It also might apply to some type 2 or void experiences because the void is kind of like the tunnel that is reported in many standard NDEs. So maybe they just spend longer in the tunnel or some other waiting state or at least perceive themselves as being stuck there uh, instead of getting past that experience. And they may mistakenly think, uh, this is going to last forever. I'm alone forever. And they become alarmed. But eventually, if their experience had gone on longer, they would have come out of the tunnel or waiting state and everything would have been fine. I could even see this interpretation applying to some of Barbara Romer's type 4 or negative judgment experiences, which seem to be like regular NDEs except for the fact that the person feels that their life review is more negative than most people do. Well, if the person is rattled and resisting and freaking out at what's happening to them, that might color how they perceive the life review, and they might have interpreted it as more negative than it really is. But if their experience had gone on longer, the life review would have been completed and they would have realized that it, everything is actually fine. I'm not as sure that the misinterpretation proposal applies as well to type 2 and 4 experiences, but I think it certainly can apply to type 1 experiences, and it may certainly apply to various mixed experiences, which often start negative but become positive. What I don't think it applies to well are type 3, or hellish experiences, where a person sees or hears things that are objectively distressing, like suffering souls chained to walls or sitting or chained to wells or sitting on benches and moaning. How does Nancy Bush explain things like that in these experiences? From my reading, she doesn't seem to have a single approach to them, but she does a couple of things. Uh, first, she argues that even saints like Teresa of Avila, who lived in the 1500s, have had distressing NDEs. So if even saints can have them, that would be a sign that they aren't a mark of damnation. And second, if that's the case, then maybe we should look at them some other way, like symbols from our subconscious that need to be worked through, kind of like confronting the dark places of our personalities that are manifesting in symbolic forms, and we need to work through these to achieve personal integration and wholeness, or something like that. What do you make of her approach? I don't find it persuasive. Uh, first, her citation of St. Teresa of Avila doesn't work at all. I looked up the experience she cited, and it's from St. Teresa's autobiography, The Life of Teresa of Jesus. And here's the key passage. A long time after the Lord had granted me many of the favors which I have described, together with other very great ones, I was at prayer one day when suddenly, without knowing how, I found myself, as I thought, plunged right into hell. I realized that it was the Lord's will that I should see the place which the devils had prepared for me there and which I had merited for my sins. This happened in the briefest space of time, but even if I were to live for many years, I believe it would be impossible for me to forget it. The entrance, I thought, resembled a very long, narrow passage, like a furnace, very low, dark, and closely confined. The ground seemed to be full of water, which looks like filthy, evil-smelling mud, and in it were many wicked-looking reptiles. At the end... There was a hollow place scooped out of a wall like a cupboard, and it was here that I found myself in close confinement. But the sight of all this was pleasant by comparison with what I felt there. What I have said is in no way an exaggeration. So that's the passage Bush points to, but there's a huge problem with it, which is that this simply is not an NDE. 
In the first place, it's lacking the commonly reported characteristics of NDEs. Teresa does not report being out of her body. She does not report moving through a tunnel. She does say that she's confined at the end of a long, narrow passage, but she doesn't report moving through it. it she's just locked up at one end of it. There is no life review or anything like that. Just wham, she's in hell. Second, the this experience did not occur in the proximity of death or any other dangerous crisis-like experience. So it's not a near-death experience. Teresa's heart didn't stop, which actually is a good thing since they didn't know how to restart hearts in the 1500s. That's a 20th century thing. And Teresa wasn't on her deathbed. She wasn't even ill or anything like that. She was just praying one day and had a vision. And third, that's how St. Teresa interpreted this experience. If you keep reading in her autobiography, she explicitly says it was a vision that God gave her. Well, there's a difference between a vision and an NDE, and this experience presented itself to St. Teresa as a vision in life of what would happen if she died without Christ. But she wasn't dead or close to death, so this wasn't an NDE, and you thus cannot use it to say things like, even saints have distressing NDEs. That's a fundamental miscategorization. I thus think that this key claim of Bush's is simply wrong. What about the idea that distressing imagery in an NDE is subconscious symbolism that needs to be worked through? I have no problem in saying that some of what people experience and perceive in NDEs is symbolic, uh, you know, because I think that the afterlife likely exceeds our ability to imagine. So it's natural that some of what people remember once they come back would be in symbolic form. However, the idea that any distressing imagery is just stuff from our subconscious that we need to work through to find wholeness is too touchy-feely for me, and it's based on psychoanalytic theories that I don't think are scientifically well-supported. It's also likely driven, I hate to say, by wish fulfillment on Bush's part. I mean, we don't apply that logic to other distressing situations that we encounter. If you see and hear an axe murderer breaking into your house, you don't say, the axe murderer standing in front of you is a symbol from the dark side of your subconscious, and you need to work through it to achieve wholeness. If you take that approach, the axe murderer will help you achieve the opposite of wholeness by chopping you into little bits. So I think that we need to take distressing things that people see and hear in their experiences seriously, rather than dismissing them as symbols that need to be worked through. They may include symbolic content, you know, they're in, even in NDEs, but that content points to something that is real and that is distressing and that shouldn't be treated as purely illusory. Then let's talk about the possibility that the disturbing NDEs do point to something disturbing. What should we say here? The first thing that we need to do is map out the conceptual space. Uh, here in the United States, we live in a country that has historically had a Protestant majority. So the Protestant way of thinking about things tends to shape our cultural imagination, even for people who aren't Protestant. Well, from the typical Protestant perspective, though there are exceptions, there are only two after-death states, heaven and hell. So if you have an NDE and it seems distressing, you're going to say, well, that wasn't heaven, so it must have been hell. But that's a uniquely Protestant view that isn't shared by other Christians. The more historic expressions of the Christian faith, and the Jewish faith as well in its historic form, has a broader view of what can happen in the afterlife. Even if everybody ends up in heaven or hell by the end of time, that doesn't mean that other things can't happen in the short term. And some of these shorter term experiences can involve some form of challenge or distress. That's why we pray for our departed loved ones. Jews do that. Catholics do that. Eastern Orthodox do that. Oriental Orthodox do that, Assyrian Christians do that, and frankly, even many Protestants do that, even though they don't tend to have a theoretical understanding of why they should do that. 
And different religious groups use different images to try to express what our prayers are helping our departed loved ones with. For example, Eastern Orthodox Christians sometimes use the image of aerial toll houses. That's something that not all of our listeners may be familiar with. What's an aerial toll house? Well, here on Earth, a toll house is not just a type of cookie. It's a little house or booth along a road where they collect tolls, like along a toll road here in the United States. Historically, you'd stop at a little booth and pay a toll, often just a few coins or a few dollars, in order to be able to use the road. Today, you may have a transponder in your car so that you don't have to stop, or the toll system may take a picture of your license plate and then send you a bill in the mail. But the idea is that you're paying money to get to use this particular stretch of road, and historically, you'd have to stop and interact with the toll collector. Well, they had toll roads in history, too, and in the Eastern Orthodox community, the soul's journey to God is sometimes pictured like this. Thus, after the soul leaves the body, it's pictured as being escorted to God in heaven by angels, kind of like taking a journey by a road in the sky or the, in heavens. And along the way, it passes various toll houses, as many as 20 of them. While stopped at each toll house, demons accuse the soul of its sins, and they may even try to take the soul to hell if it can't satisfy them. But the faithful Christian will be able to pass through all of these toll houses, and the angels will bring it to God in heaven. And our prayers are helping the souls on their journey to God, just like our prayers can help travelers here on earth. Well, various Orthodox saints have had visions concerning this experience, and it may correspond to how some people perceive the soul's journey in the afterlife. In fact, the type 2 void experience that Nancy Bush herself experienced sounds to me a lot like a toll house experience. She reported that she seemed to be on her way through space towards where God was, and then she was confronted by a group of mocking beings that tried to get her to lose her faith in the reality of things. This is all there is. This is all there ever was. This is it. Anything else you remember is a joke. You are not real. You never were real. You never existed. Your life never existed. The world never existed. It was a game you were allowed to invent. There was never anything or anyone. That's the joke. That it was all a joke. Whatever you remember is part of the joke. Your mother, your babies, they were never real. This is all there is. All there ever was. Just this. Now, those claims are patently false. Even if all your memories were unreal, you know, like a dream, you must be real in order to have had them. Uh, when the circles told Nancy that she never existed, that her life was a game that she was allowed to invent, well, even if that were true, that would prove that she must be real because non real things can't invent games. Rene Descartes was right, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So Nancy perceived encountering mocking beings that tried to deceive her on her way to God and get her to lose faith, thinking that nothing was real and she was alone forever. That sounds quite a bit like an aerial toll house experience with demons trying to trick or deceive you. And as far as I'm concerned, that may have been what it was. The afterlife so far exceeds our imaginations that it may appear differently to different people. Back in episode 269, and then again in its follow-up episode 270, we heard about Father Nathan Castle's reported ministry to souls who are on their way to God and all the different ways that they visualized the afterlife that they were experiencing on their journey, which in the Catholic tradition would be understood as a form of purgatory. Purgatory is often associated with the image of a purifying fire that burns away whatever imperfections that we still have at the end of our lives, and Pope Benedict XVI speculated that this image of fire represents the fiery love of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all impurities. But cleansing and how we perceive and understand it can take many different forms, and 
For some people, it might be like going through an unpleasant toll house. In any event, I think that there is more conceptual space here for what may be going on in near, distressing near-death experiences than just hell. Some of them may involve hell, but some of them also may involve complex temporary stages of a person's journey that can be understood from a Catholic perspective as part of the process of purgatory. So, good news. If someone is having a distressing NDE, that may not be a sign that they're lost. Maybe they're just being purified, whether they realize it at the time or not. Still, that wouldn't mean that hell is never involved in distressing NDEs, would it? No, it wouldn't. Uh, and people who actually go to hell for reals probably not, would not be allowed to come back. So we don't hear about actual permanent damnations. Instead, what we seem to hear about would be warnings, like the experience of the Jewish woman Rachel, who had a mixed experience. After her car accident, she perceived someone who looked like Jesus, and when he took her by the hand, she felt peace and joy and never wanted to leave him. But he showed her a well, and on one side of the well were souls that were chained and suffering. And she understood that if she remained, she would become like them and be lost. He also showed her her children inside the well calling out for her, including a child that she hadn't had yet. And she understood that despite the peace and joy she felt, she needed to go back to the world and fulfill her responsibilities as a mother. So I would look at that and say, okay, it was a warning. Uh, the Jesus figure, who I would interpret as Jesus himself, showed her that the afterlife can be absolutely wonderful, but it won't be if you don't fulfill your responsibilities. And so she needed to go back and do that. Not all war warning experiences are like hers, though, and they can take different forms, like the woman Anita, who was trying to commit suicide by drug overdose, and she encountered her grandfather and Jesus, uh, and they gave her a negative life review, showing her all the things that she did wrong, and then her grandfather told her that she had to go back, and once she got back, she concluded that this experience helped her, that it was exactly the kick in the pants she needed, and she reformed her life. There was also uh, one person's brother-in-law who reported slipping downstairs and coming face to face with the very doors of hell itself and seeing the suffering souls on benches outside, uh, apparently waiting to go in. So he struggled back up the stairs to the world of the living. I would interpret all of these as warning experiences that showed people what could happen, what could await them but they were allowed to return and make changes in their lives. However, here we're crossing over into the faith perspective as we're starting to talk about what looks like hell and who gets to go there. Then let's switch formally to the faith perspective. You've now laid out a number of possibilities of how different distressing NDEs could be interpreted. Let's go back through the different types of them and have you summarize how they might be interpreted. Well, type 1 or inverted experiences are like regular NDEs, except the person perceives them different on an emotional level. This could be due to temporary panic and an adjustment reaction to the thought of being dead. And if the experience had continued longer, the person may have relaxed, stopped fighting what was going on, be reconciled to it, and it would have become a positive experience. It's also possible that the distress they experienced could be conceived of as part of their purification. But however you understand that, they were allowed to come back, and so this wasn't a literal experience of hell. When it comes to type 2 or void experiences, this also could be a perceptual thing, since NDEs commonly involve going through something like a tunnel and Maybe some people perceive this as taking a long time or they think they've become stuck when they haven't, and they feel like they're alone in a void and have a negative emotional reaction. But this is just a temporary phase, and if the experience had lasted longer, they would have, had, they would have come out of this and the experience would have turned positive. This waiting alone period could also be understood as part of their purification. And in some cases, they might be allowed to encounter things that are challenging, like the mocking circles that lied to Nancy Bush and told her that nothing was real in what seemed a lot like an aerial tollhouse experience. 
But however you understand that, these people were allowed to come back, and thus they did not experience final damnation. When it comes to type 3, or hellish experiences, I think these are straightforward warnings. Uh, The people who have them are shown what could happen if they don't live the way they need to, and they may even show what would happen if the person had a permanent death right now. But ultimately, they were allowed to come back, and so they did not experience final damnation. When it comes to type 4 or negative judgment experiences, I think the situation is mixed. Some of these could be misinterpretations of life reviews that actually would have ended positively, only the person wasn't perceiving them that way at the time because of anxiety and their adjustment reaction to being dead. And whether or not that was the reason for their distress, the distress, once again, could have been part of their purification. Or it could be that the life review really was heading towards a negative verdict, and they accurately sensed that. But then they were still allowed to come back, and so they were not ultimately damned. And finally, when it comes to mixed experiences, the distress the distressing elements that they contain could be understood as misperception due to an adjustment reaction that would have resolved in time, or as part of their purification, or as a warning of what could happen but doesn't need to happen, as with Rachel's experience of the Jesus figure and the well. Fundamentally, though, everyone who reports these experiences was allowed to come back, and so nobody was finally damned in them. Everybody was given the opportunity to think about and reflect on the experience and make any changes that are needed in their lives. Can we learn anything from distressing NDEs about how many people go to heaven, purgatory, and hell? I don't think so. Uh, First, I don't presently have good statistics on how common the different types of distressing NDEs are. Uh, The IAN's website says that type 1 inverted experiences are the most common, uh, type 2 are less common, and type 3 are the least common, but I don't have precise numbers. Second, there are too many different ways of interpreting the different experiences. As we've just heard in the summary of the different types, some of them might have turned positive with time. Uh, Some may have involved purification or purgatory, and some may have been warnings of hell. But nobody went completely through the experience. Everybody returned to life, which is how we know about them. So nobody ended up in heaven permanently, and nobody ended up in hell permanently. And many of the experiencers didn't even seem to have the concept of purgatory for interpreting what was happening to them. As a result, we can't reliably infer anything about how many people end up going to purgatory or ending up in heaven or hell, remembering that everyone who goes to purgatory ends up going to heaven. It's just a temporary purification to get you ready for heaven. The fact that they all returned means that none of their fates were fixed yet, since they came back to life and continued using free will. What about those who have committed suicide? Can we at least infer that the people who committed suicide and then had distressing NDEs would have gone to hell if they had remained dead? No, we can't. Uh, Some of the reasons are given by the IAN's webpage. Although it may be tempting to conclude that people who attempt suicide are being punished for trying to induce their own deaths, We must avoid this temptation, as the following paragraph will explain. People who are in a distressed frame of mind at the time of their near-death episode and those who were raised to expect distress during death may be more prone to distressing NDEs. People who attempt suicide are almost always in a distressed frame of mind. Usually, they're attempting suicide because they feel themselves to be in unendurable and unending emotional or physical pain. In addition, they are almost certainly aware of the widely held belief that suicide is cowardly and or the wrong way to escape the pain of life. Although they hope for relief from their pain, they may also consciously or unconsciously fear punishment. In a heightened state of pain, as well as of fear and or guilt, they are highly distressed and consequently may be somewhat more prone to having a DNDE. 
And I think that's right. If someone is highly distressed when they attempt suicide, they may carry that distress with them, and it may color how they perceive their near-death experience. Furthermore, they may well not have been fully responsible for their actions. The pain that they were in could have caused them not to have been fully responsible for their actions, in which case they may not have gone to hell, but begun to experience purgatory from which they would ultimately emerge and go to heaven. So distressing NDEs in cases of suicide don't really let us have a firm conclusion about people who would have gone to hell, because as we heard at the start of today's program, committing suicide does not automatically mean hell. Most fundamentally, though, I don't think we can infer anything about how many people end up going where, because everyone who has a distressing NDE is someone who came back and had the opportunity to make changes in their lives. The people whose fates really were fixed after dying didn't come back. Do we know anything from the faith perspective about how many people go to purgatory and how many end up in heaven or hell? There are different opinions about this in the Christian community, and that's because the data is mixed. There are some passages in the Bible that can be interpreted as sounding like few people go to heaven, and there are some passages that can be interpreted as sounding like a lot of people go to heaven. So there are different ways of analyzing and interpreting the very limited data that we have. We can discuss that more fully another time. A recent opinion on the matter was expressed by Pope Benedict XVI in his encyclical letter on Christian hope, Spes Salvi. He wrote, There can be people who have totally destroyed their desire for truth and readiness to love, people for whom everything has become a lie, people who have lived for hatred and have suppressed all love within themselves. This is a terrifying thought, but alarming profiles of this type can be seen in certain figures of our own history. In such people, all would be beyond remedy, and the destruction of good would be irrevocable. This is what we mean by the word hell. On the other hand, there can be people who are utterly pure, completely permeated by God, and thus fully open to their neighbors, people for whom communion with God even now gives direction to their entire being, and whose journey towards God only brings to fulfillment what they already are. Yet we know from experience that neither case is normal in human life. For the great majority of people, we may suppose, there remains in the depths of their being an ultimate interior openness to truth, to love, to God. In the concrete choices of life, however, it is covered over by ever new compromises with evil. Much filth covers purity, but the thirst for purity remains. And it still constantly reemerges from all that is base and remains present in the soul. What happens to such individuals when they appear before the judge? Will all the impurity they have amassed through life suddenly cease to matter? What else might occur? St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, gives us an idea of the differing impact of God's judgment according to each person's particular circumstances. He does this using images in which, in some way, try to express the invisible without it being possible for us to conceptualize these images simply because we can neither see into the world beyond death, nor do we have any experience of it. Paul begins by saying that Christian life is built upon a common foundation, Jesus Christ. This foundation endures. If we have stood firm on this foundation and built our life upon it, we know that it cannot be taken away from us even in death. Then Paul continues, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In this text, it is in any case evident that our salvation can take different forms, that some of what is built may be burned down, that in order to be saved, we personally have to pass through fire, so as to become fully open to receiving God and able to take our place at the table of the eternal marriage feast. 
So Pope Benedict offers a fundamentally optimistic view. He acknowledges that some people have totally destroyed their desire for truth and love, and he said that there are historical figures that seem to be like this. I strongly suspect he was referring to Adolf Hitler. On the other hand, he says that some people are already completely permeated by the love of God and neighbor, but he says that experience shows that neither of these types of people are normal in human life. He thus says that we may suppose that for the great majority of people, they have an inner openness to God, to love, and to truth deep down, but that this is buried over with various forms of compromise that we need to be purified of, and so these people would experience a purgatorial cleansing. Pope Benedict thus seems to suppose that a small minority of people would go straight to heaven, that the great majority of people would go to heaven after being purified in purgatory, and that a small minority would go to hell. This is a comforting perspective, but we need to be careful because God hasn't told us for certain that this is the case. In 2003, the great theologian Cardinal Avery Dulles wrote an article on this subject called The Population of Hell, and he concluded, The search for numbers in the demography of hell is futile. God, in his wisdom, has seen fit not to disclose any statistics. Several sayings of Jesus in the Gospels give the impression that the majority are lost. Paul, without denying the likelihood that some sinners will die without sufficient repentance, teaches that the grace of Christ is more powerful than sin. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Romans 5.20 Passages such as these permit us to hope that very many, if not all, will be saved. All told, it is good that God has left us without exact information. If we knew that virtually everybody would be damned, we would be tempted to despair. If we knew that all, or nearly all, are saved, we might become presumptuous. If we knew that some fixed percent, say 50, would be saved, we would be caught in an unholy rivalry. We would rejoice in every sign that others were among the lost, since our own chances of election would thereby be increased. Such a competitive spirit would hardly be compatible with the gospel. We are forbidden to seek our own salvation in a selfish and egotistical way. We are keepers of our brothers and sisters. The more we work for their salvation, the more of God's favor we can expect for ourselves. Those of us who believe and make use of the means that God has provided for the forgiveness of sins and the reform of life have no reason to fear. We can be sure that Christ, who died on the cross for us, will not fail to give us the grace we need. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and that if we persevere in that love, nothing whatever can separate us from Christ. That is all the assurance we can have, and it should be enough. And I think that's a good perspective. When you really dig into the details of what Scripture says on this subject, it's not as clear as you might think, for reasons we can discuss in the future. I think that we ultimately can't say what percentage of people go to heaven or hell. However, I find Pope Benedict's approach attractive, and even if the data from positive and negative NDEs isn't conclusive, since it's based only on the people who came back, it is at least suggestive that a large or large-ish majority of people might be saved. Let's finish by looking at some practical matters. We're all going to die someday. So if a person ends up having a disturbing NDE, is there anything you can do about it while you're having it? To answer that question, let's look at a few more cases of when people had distressing NDEs. First, Nancy Bush reports on the experience of a man named Donald. She describes his situation as follows. A 64-year-old man developed a post-operative infection following surgery for an aneurysm. At first, he felt motion and seemed to be traveling on a train, he thought, nearly filled with passengers. They were wearing black hats with black veils which covered their faces and were tied under the chin. The train made several stops, and at each one, some passengers got off. After a while, he realized that he was the only passenger remaining. And here is what Donald said happened next. I was now in the last row of the train alone. The train started with an awful jerk and stopped short, and I was jerked from my seat and tossed in the air away from the train. As I looked under me, the train was melting. A strong wind was pulling me into what seemed to be a funnel shaped like a cornucopia, 
only opened at both ends. I was flying and drawn directly into the vortex or funnel. At the end, the lights were blinding and crystal flashing was unbearable. As I neared the very end, I was reaching for the sides, trying to stop myself from falling off the end into the flashing crystal. I felt that I did not want to go on. If there were some way I could explain to you what happened, I vividly remember screaming, God, I'm not ready. Please help me. As I write this letter, I'm reliving it. I remember that when I screamed, an arm shot out of the sky and grabbed my hand, and at the last second, I was kept from falling off the end of the funnel, the lights flashing, and the heat was really something. So Donald had a distressing NDE in which he called out to God for help. And here's the experience of a man named Lewis who had a type 2 or void experience. The thought occurred to me that I might be passing into another life or something. But there was no color, no sound, no heat, no cold, nothing. I asked myself if this was what I had been working toward. Is this all there is? Is this what I would get for faith and abstinence? Lutherans are taught that one is justified by faith alone, and I was doubting. I was really frightened, terrified. I was weak in faith. I was going to go to hell. I started praying, real sincere prayer, prayer for faith. Don't let me go to hell. Strengthen my faith. Give me another chance. Send me back. Give me more faith, more faith. I was back and up by the ceiling and then back in my body. So... Like Donald, Lewis found himself in a distressing NDE and called out to God for salvation. And like Donald, he was rescued. So I think that an obvious thing to do for those who are having distressing NDEs is to call out to God for help. In fact, I'd recommend that to anyone in such a situation. There also may be other things you can do, like in the experience of the brother-in-law who slid down Uh, stairs and found himself at the doors of hell. He then struggled back up the staircase, a sign of determination not to end up in this fate, which can be understood as a symbol of his determination to make whatever changes he needed to make. Sometimes there may be additional practical things you can do, such as the case of a man named Lou who tried to commit suicide by hanging himself. From the roof of the utility shed in my backyard, I jumped to the ground. Luckily for me, I had forgotten the broken lawn chair that lay near the shed. My feet hit the chair and broke my fall, or my neck would have been broken. I hung in the rope and strangled. I was outside my physical body. I saw my body hanging in the rope. It looked awful. I was terrified, could see and hear, but different, hard to explain. Demons were all around me. I could hear them, but not see them. They chattered like blackbirds. It was as if they knew they had me and had all eternity to drag me down into hell to torment me. It would have been the worst kind of hell, trapped hopeless between two worlds, wandering, lost, and confused for all eternity. I had to get back into my body. Oh my God, I needed help. I ran to the house, went in through the door without opening it, and cried out to my wife, but she could not hear me, so I went right into her body. I could see and hear with her eyes and ears. Then I made contact, heard her say, Oh my God. She grabbed a knife from the kitchen chair and ran out to where I was hanging and got up on an old chair and cut me down. And so Lou had a distressing NDE. He also had an OBE or out-of-body experience, and he realized that he urgently needed help. So in his out-of-body state, he rushed into his house to summon his wife. She couldn't hear him, but Lou thought creatively and got inside her body that allowed him to make mental contact with her, and she realized what was happening with him. So she grabbed a knife, and she ran to the shed and cut him down and then called the paramedics, saving his life. So I'd recommend that anyone who's having a distressing NDE do whatever is possible for them. By all means, call out to God for help, like Douglas and Lewis. If there is a way to work with the experience, like the brother-in-law struggling up the staircase, do that. And if there's a way to summon emergency help, like when Lou got inside his wife's body to make mental contact with her, then do that. Do whatever's possible and entrust yourself to God who loves you and always has loved you. How should people who have had disturbing NDEs react to them afterwards? 
How can they deal with having had such an experience? How can they find peace and live with it? This will vary from person to person, depending in part on what type of experience they've had. However, something that's common to all distressing NDE experiencers is that they will need time to think about the experience and what it does and doesn't mean. It also may help them at some point to talk about it with others, including supportive loved ones or a supportive counselor or a supportive member of the clergy. But it's important that the person be supportive and take their experience seriously rather than dismissing it. It should be someone who will be compassionate and helpful. And there are such people. It's just a question of finding them and contacting them. I hope that this episode itself will help people who have had distressing NDEs and that they'll think through the different explanations and interpretations that we've offered here. In looking back on a distressing NDE, it's possible that it had an entirely natural cause, like maybe I was in pain and drugged and thought the medical workers were monsters who were attacking me. And even if it doesn't have a natural explanation, it's not as bad as you think. Maybe the distress you experienced, especially in type 1 or the inverse experience, was just because you were freaking out at the time, and it would have turned out pleasant once you had a chance to get used to it. Or maybe the distress you experienced in several of the types of experiences were just part of your purification on your way to God. Or, worst case, maybe it was a warning that you need to change some things in your life. But the good news is that you were given the chance to make the needed changes. It was just a warning. And you were allowed to come back so that you can make better decisions. In fact, based on the research that's been done, coming to God in a conversion experience and making changes in in one's life is reported to be one of the most successful ways that people who have had disturbing NDEs have come to terms with them and come to regard them as actually helpful. So I'd say make what Catholics call an examination of conscience. Look at your life and what you've been doing and determine what changes might need to be made. If you're a Catholic, then I'd say go to confession, which is a means that God has given us not just to provide for the forgiveness of sins, but also to give us the assurance that we've been forgiven. In John chapter 20, after Jesus rose from the dead, he breathed on his disciples to empower them with the Holy Spirit to forgive sins. And he told them, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. So Jesus specially empowered his ministers with the Holy Spirit to forgive people's sins. And personally, I find the sacrament of confession one of the most emotionally moving sacraments. There's nothing like having a man authorized and empowered by God to forgive you to absolve your sins. It's not dependent on your mind or how you feel. You don't have to twist your mind into just the right shape to be forgiven. You just Turn from your sins, acknowledge them, and receive God's forgiveness from a man that God has empowered to forgive you. That's real assurance of forgiveness. And if you're not a Catholic, then, well, as a Catholic apologist, I'd say become one so that you can experience forgiveness in this way too. But ultimately, don't let disturbing near-death experiences terrify or paralyze you. Even the worst ones are warnings warnings that need to be acted on, but still just warnings for forgiveness is always available. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, There is no offense, however serious, that the Church cannot forgive. There is no one, however wicked and guilty, who may not confidently hope for forgiveness, provided his repentance is honest. Christ, who died for all men, desires that in his Church the gates of forgiveness should always be open to anyone who turns away from sin. And that's a good note to close on. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on distressing NDEs? Distressing NDEs are, by definition, distressing. It's understandable that people who have had them are reluctant to talk about them, especially just after they've happened. And it's understandable but unfortunate that near-death researchers ignored them for so long. But the good news is that they are being studied now. There's a lot we still don't know, including how common they are, but they're 
they are more common than many have supposed, involving perhaps one in five NDEs or even more. Researchers have identified several types of them, as we've covered, and the distressing aspects may have a variety of causes. In some cases, they may be purely natural. In other cases, the distress may be just an adjustment reaction to the surprising and distressing experience of dying. Or it may be part of the soul's purification on its way to God, or it may be a warning that the person needs to change things in their life. But precisely because the person was allowed to come back, it was only a warning. It was meant to help the person. And in life, it is never too late to make changes and come back to God. Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners? We'll have links to Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, uh, Nancy Evans Bush's book, Dancing Past the Dark, Bruce Grayson and others' book, The Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, 30 Years of Investigation, Barbara Romer's book, uh, Blessings in Disguise, Another Side of the Near-Death Experience, The Life of St. Teresa of Avila by Herself, Nancy Bush's Psy Encyclopedia article on distressing near-death experiences, Bruce Grayson and Nancy Bush's 1993 article, Distressing Near-Death Experiences, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, or IAN's webpage on distressing near-death experiences, Benedict XVI's encyclical Spes Salvi, and Avery Dulles's article, The Population of Hell. So that's it from us this time. We would love to hear your theories about negative near-death experiences. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. They're available for hire, so if you need video or animation work done check them out and you can sample their wares by looking at the video version of this podcast at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And uh, while you're there, be sure and uh, like, comment, and subscribe. When you interact with the video that way, it tells YouTube you found the video engaging and other people might find it engaging too. So it will share it with more people and you can help the channel grow by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And I am trying to grow my channel, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. Thank you so much for doing so. I also want to say a special word of thank you to Dom's wife, Melanie, for her voiceover work on this episode. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, this week we talked about hell, which is commonly pictured as involving fire, but in a not good way. So next week, we're going to talk about another experience involving fire that's more positive. We're going to be looking at a miracle that's reported to happen every year at the tomb of Jesus in Jerusalem. Every year, the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem enters the tomb of Christ on Holy Saturday and emerges with candles that the faithful regard as having been miraculously lit. So this is the mystery of the holy fire. What's the truth in this situation? Are the candles lit by divine power, or are they lit by some natural means, or what's going on? That's what we'll be discussing next week. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt or mug or any other kind of merchandise we offer in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. Show your Mysterious World fandom. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 292. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com.
and by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com and by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.